I'm going to try and pull a few things together maybe um, and maybe refer back to some of the content of what we talked about today. We, we have a major global challenge. Um, human activity is putting such strain on the natural functions of the earth that the ability of the planet's ecosystems to sustain future generations can no longer be taken for granted. And I'm sure you're aware that just last week, uh, the World Wildlife Fund, they produced their um, um, most recent report. And it instanced something we've been talking about all day, and that's the tremendous loss of biodiversity on the planet uh, in terms of the planet's living ecosystems. But very interestingly, in terms of the commentary that emanated uh, with the publication of that report, there was something that was said. We're the first generation, we, in the room here, we're the first generation that have access to the information as to how bad things have got. And potentially we could be the last generation that have the ability to do something about it. And it's something that we need to, I think, bear in mind because I think that is going to focus attention if we realize that we do have a responsibility here to hand on the planet and to hand on our lands and our farmlands to the next generation. Unfortunately, uh, the indicators aren't great. The International Panel on Climate Change, uh, in their 2014 report, they showed uh, global warming around the planet. And as you can see, the darker orange and red areas are where we've already gone beyond one and a half degrees. And some of the purple areas are where we've gone beyond two degrees, an increase in two degrees in temperature in uh, roughly the last 100 years. And even in terms of the uh, rise in um, sea levels, we've actually nearing now an increase in 10 inches over roughly the same period, about uh, uh, 120 years. So we actually have a major challenge ahead of us, okay? Um, there's twice as much carbon stored in soils around the globe as there is in the atmosphere, okay? But uh, you heard Fiona talking earlier on uh, about the level of land degradation around the world. We're losing 25 billion tons of topsoil. It's actually estimated that it could be up to 40 billion tons and the International Food Policy Research Institute, they've come along now and they say it could be 75 billion tons because the 25 to 40 billion is actually measurable. It has been measured. But we're not getting information from some of the most sensitive climates around the world, particularly in developing countries. And I mean, I can testify to it. Everywhere I go, soil erosion is a major, major issue. And it's something that we have to st stabilize for rural communities that don't have access to any of the inputs or the technologies that we actually have today. So the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change in Paris 2015, we had over 100 countries involved and 119, including Ireland, pledged to reduce agricultural related greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and, and when we look at those greenhouse gas emissions, agriculture accounts for between five and six gigatons per year okay, of those emissions. So at the convention, uh, you know, it was roughly estimated that nearly one gigaton of carbon dioxide reduction is now required from agriculture. That's 100 million tonnes per year to actually get us back to less than 2% of an increase in global temperatures by 2050, okay? And, and Earlier this year, I was in Brussels, and um, you know we we're kind of insulated from this back at home from the press and media. But you know, you know, if you look at uh, some of the uh, graphs and figures that have been uh, shown at uh, different events in Brussels, what you'll see is Ireland has one of the worst records at dealing with um, global warming, climate change, particularly with relation to reducing our uh, greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture. So uh, Michael D in his inauguration has um, highlighted that climate change is going to be one of the areas that he's going to focus on in his second term. And I really hope you know that people follow suit and support him uh, in terms of doing that. But we actually need to stop talking the talk and we need to start walking and doing something about it. 
I actually have shown this slide on a number of occasions. I show it every year to students, uh, both in UCD and in Waterford Institute of Technology, where I do some part-time lecturing. But it's, uh, if we look at the world's croplands and in terms of uh, global production and what we do, the vast majority is intensively cultivated. And this has been covered by all of the speakers in different ways uh, during the course of today. But when we actually turn over and intensively cultivate soil, we put oxygen into the soil, excess oxygen, but we're actually destroying soil structure. And not alone are we destroying soil structure, we're destroying habitats for the microorganisms in the soil. The interesting thing is the byproduct is a flux of carbon dioxide emissions and even nitrous oxide emissions and different emissions from the exhaust fumes from the machinery that we use to do this, which is a greenhouse gas which contributes to climate change. And we have instances of increased flooding and drought um, in countries right throughout the world. But by reducing this organic matter, we actually take away the constituent that can actually insulate soils from these flood events, but also can cope with potentially reducing the need for irrigation. But the other thing organic matter does, which should have been brought out by all of the speakers this morning, is that it's inherent natural fertility in the soil. So when we take it out, we're brought into this situation. It's like a domino effect. We need to use, we need to use more fertilizers to compensate for its loss. And that leads to more nitrous oxide emissions, which again is a greenhouse gas. And we need to use more fossil fuel inputs to actually achieve the good yields, the good conventional yields we, we strive to achieve. And the process starts again. And it's completely unsustainable. It's completely unsustainable. Right? And you don't need to be, uh, you know, a very knowledgeable scientist to just look at this and, you know, tease out the various arrows and what happens. So what we need to do is we need to reverse this process. And how we reverse it is going to the point of origin, okay, which is the intensive soil cultivation. And I'm not exaggerating about this. This is from a field in uh, County Wexford. Um, it's about 10 years ago, but um, it's just a client that I was dealing with down there. And these two soil samples, they're just from five meters apart in the same field, in the same field. But the soil on the right is uh, intensively cultivated, power harrowed soil over the last 15 to 20 years. And on the left is soil that hasn't been disturbed at all okay, uh, from the base of the ditch at the side of the field. Now, it took a long time for that degradation process to happen, 15 to 20 years. And the question is, how quickly can you rehabilitate it? You can actually make significant strides in quite a short period of time. And it's all to do with carbon management. It's all to do with carbon management. So if we look at soil carbon and greenhouse gases, soil carbon management, it affects emissions from soils. Right? Proactive soil carbon management compensates other agricultural emissions, nitrous oxide and methane, and I'll come to nitrous oxide in a while. And proactive soil carbon management compensates fossil fuel emissions from other sectors like energy and transport. And Dan was right, actually, you know, the solution is agriculture. You know, we can do so much in terms of reducing global warming. It's quite uh, incredible uh, what the power that we potentially could have would be. Improved soil carbon levels would protect soils from ongoing degradation, both in terms of depletion and also erosion. And soil carbon management is essential for climate change adaptation, but also for mitigation. Okay? Because if we reduce the emissions, uh, we're mitigating uh, the effects of climate change. And um, one of the things we probably, and I don't want to kind of categorize too many systems because uh, there are so many that are described now, it's a big long list, but uh, of course we've got our conventional plow-based system, which results in CO2 emissions, and for every tonne of carbon we lose, we're actually pumping 3.7 tonnes of carbon dioxide into the air. Uh, minimum tillage, it depends on the system, but you know we haven't seen any great shift in terms of soil carbon in northwestern Europe in particular. And in terms of no tillage, and with the proviso, it, exactly what Gary said earlier on, that uh, it's not no tillage, it's not the mechanics of no tillage, it's actually conservation agriculture and using rotations and getting cover crops growing in the system. But there's a potential to actually sequester or to put back in and this is based on northwestern European research, anywhere between 0 0.3 and 0 0.8 tonnes 
of carbon per hectare per year into, back into the soil, back into the ground. And the interesting thing is this, this soil carbon, it's not even recognized in terms of emissions trading schemes or systems at the moment in, Europe, in the European context, which is rather amazing. The other thing is the elephant in the room is fertilizer, right? And it's actually nitrogen fertilizer um, because of uh, the emissions that emanate from that. And one of the slides that I showed there, it showed nitrous oxide emissions from the use of fertilizers. It's not from the use of the fertilizer itself, it's the manufacturing process because it is so energy intensive the production of nitrogen fertilizer in particular. It far exceeds the production uh, energy requirement for phosphate and potash. And in actual fact, in terms of fertilizer use and nitrogen fertilizer use, we're actually uh, using about 4.3 uh, kilograms or emitting 4.3 kilograms of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere for every kilo of nitrogen that we use, fertilizer nitrogen. And it all goes back, it all goes back to producing, packaging, transporting, and applying. And the interesting thing I sometimes say to farmers, all during that time, all during that process, 78 to 80 percent of the air around you is contains nitrogen. So why are we ignoring that fact and why don't we do something about it? And it's very interesting in the Irish context, this is old research, it goes back to the late 1980s, uh, Michael Neal, who worked with the uh, Water Board, or EPA now, um, in Kilkenny. But there's a direct correlation between the land area ploughed in a river catchment and nitrogen loss to water courses, to rivers. And we've spent billions, literally, throughout the European Union, and tens and hundreds of millions, by the way, in Ireland, trying to reduce nitrate and phosphate levels in our waters. Okay, so, I mean, don't ignore this. This soil disturbance is actually setting in, in train a whole sequence of events, a whole equation of events that are causing us trouble in the longer term. Um, now, uh, Gary showed this slide from the NRCS. It's actually from uh, Don Rakowski. He was a soil scientist. Uh, he's retired now and he was from the USDA Soils Laboratory in Morris in Minnesota. And Rakowski spent all of his life working on this, but he really honed in on this whole concept of carbon and how important it was as the keystone in an archway that governs an awful lot with relation to physical, uh, chemical, and biological processes in the soil. So if you don't actually understand this, you're actually, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to farm with your hands tied behind your back effectively. You need to get carbon into the system. And the carbon can come in many forms. You have the green carbon in the form of cover crops. You have the brown carbon in the form of residues. And you've got the black carbon in the form of refined copper composts uh, that can be used as well. And this is a stem of brown carbon, okay? And this is under the microscope and it's just a, a bit of wheat stubble. And uh, you can see some of the protozoa and you can see the hyphae from the fungi and some of this sporulating or reproducing during the breakdown process of uh, that straw. But what we don't see uh, actually is the structure of this, you know, because this is more lignified and it's really, really complex. It's really complex structure, and it's difficult to break down in the soil. But it contains a lot of carbon. And that carbon is the engine for fertility. It actually regulates, to a large extent, the chemical activity and the nutrient cycling, recycling in the soil. And also, from a physical point of view, it has a tremendous impact in terms of um, regulating some of the difficulties we experience with the weather. So soil carbon for ecosystem services. This picture is from uh, Clonmel in County Tipperary where I'm from. And if we go from the bottom left up to the right, you can see what's happening, okay? We've made major flood events. But if we look at where the origin of the water is, and if you go out from the actual flood area itself or the floodplain itself, a lot of this water is actually coming off agricultural land. But you see, politicians don't go out there. 
OPW people don't go out there, engineers don't go out there because it's inclement weather and very often we're ignoring where the water is coming from. What's actually happening is the water is hitting main river channels and tributaries of main river channels at such a speed that it doesn't matter, you know, uh, as time goes on, in Clamwell we actually spend 17 million on flood defences, right? And I've been working on the Bandon Flood Relief Project from an environmental perspective in the last couple of years, and we've a significant amount more than that been spent down there. And the point about it is that it's, you know, it's hard engineering that we're, we're, we're deferring to, you know, we're, we're doing uh, dredging, we're, you know, we're using concrete boulders, we're actually building up key walls, uh, we're using buns in certain respects, but nothing has been done about the catchment or the gathering area for the water that hits these floodplains in different regions and areas around the country, okay? So from an ecosystem service point of view, we really need to focus on this. In Africa, uh, one of the things we always try and do is we always try and cover soil in whatever possible way we can as a way of guarding the primary resource that a farmer has. So what it means is you know, this maize plant uh, or this maize field actually covering the soil um, with brown carbon, okay, uh, to guard against surface runoff and the loss of nutrients from fields. And even in this banana plantation, which is in Malawi, it can mean the use of a green manure cover crop. This is jack bean or macuna, um, which is grown. And by the way, the macuna is fantastic. Fixes nitrogen for the plantain or the banana plants in that plantation. And also can be used, the leaves can be used as a vegetable by human beings, but also the, um, the beans themselves with a bit of soakage can also form part of human dietary protein. And this is in Dakota, and it's to the line, and two farmers practicing two different systems. Uh, on the left is conservation agriculture, with no tillage, direct seeding, but leaving brown carbon on the surface of the ground. And on the right is conventional, the same crop, but I mean, look at the impact of rainfall on that area. So the point is, if you're serious, if you're really serious about dealing with flood events and surface water runoff, overland flow, and, you know, uh, these spate floods that we're actually getting that's costing the taxpayer a huge amount of money and will cost us even more in years to come. We need to get back to understanding what carbon can do, not just on tillage soils, but also on grassland uh, regions as well around the country. So we've talked a lot about soil carbon benefits today, and there are many folds. So in terms of soil, We've got a reduction of soil erosion by water and wind. We've got an increase in soil organic matter content uh, when we um, get carbon into the system. We get an increase in natural fertility of the soil. We get improved soil structure and less compaction. With relation to water, we get improved groundwater and surface water quality. Okay, Water quality is determined by how we manage waterfall onto our land. We get improved biodiversity, not just in the water, by the way, but also in the soil itself and on top of the land, both in terms of microfauna, but also mammals and farm birds, um, which are protected under European legislation. And in the air, we get fixation of atmospheric CO2 back into the soil, and we get reduced CO2 emissions into the atmosphere, again, which is very, very desirable. So the question is, uh, to what extent these benefits actually happen? And the European Commission, they've recently set up a project, CERCASA project, and it's got four key objectives. And it's strengthened the international research community on agricultural soil carbon sequestration. Okay? And they're not just focusing on Europe, they're actually liaising with um, colleagues in the United States, in South America, in Australia as well provided improved understanding of agricultural soil carbon sequestration and its potential for climate change mitigation and adaptation, and getting stakeholders' views and knowledge needs on agricultural soil carbon sequestration and climate change, and a more structured approach by preparing an international research consortium. Um, I have some reservations about this because I think formal research has failed us 
you know, um, over the last 10, 20 years. Um, because an awful lot of what we've been talking about today has been farmer-led and farmer-driven. And very often the farmers themselves had to work in isolation. And the research community actually frowned upon what they were doing, you know. But we're nearly looking at a 180 degree turnabout now in terms of what's happening. So what they're looking at is to what extent does soil carbon improve soils in terms of quality, structure, workability, resilience to erosion? What, to what extent does soil carbon does it improve water relations, infiltration, percolation and drainage, quality of groundwater and surface water, plant available water in soil and the potential to reduce irrigation uh, offtakes in drier climates. To improve biodiversity in terms of the microbiology, the soil flora, the soil fauna, birds and mammals, improve yield stability and potential, prevent nutrient losses from agricultural land, reduce demand for fertilizer inputs, and reduce the requirement for crop inputs, okay? The interesting thing is we have answers to a lot of these questions, exactly what Gary Zimmer said uh, when he was summing up um, earlier on. We do have a lot of research that has been conducted and we have an awful lot of farmer experience in this regard over the last 40 years. So in terms of EU policy support, uh, in fairness to the European Commission, um, in the early 2000s, and I was involved in some of the uh, work that was uh, been done at that time, um, they brought together a soil thematic strategy, which was going to be, at that time, a precursor to the Soils Framework Directive, okay? which was going to be an adjunct to the Water Framework Directive. Okay? Environmental policy, by the way, in Europe, it's focused on three areas, right? clean water, uh, healthy soil, and clean air. All right, and these are the three, and it's up to individual member states to decide what they're going to do to achieve these overall objectives. The thing about it is the thematic strategy never actually developed into a soils framework because um, there was resistance from some member states, um, the Netherlands in particular, and the United Kingdom for some reason, they also felt that they were doing enough on soil protection, but our House of Commons report a couple of years ago said that not enough was been done on soil protection in the United Kingdom, okay? Um, so uh, it depends on who you access for your information. A lot of people believe there's very little soil erosion in Ireland and soil organic matter levels are a-okay. If I talk to anybody in a soils laboratory in the country, they will tell you that tillage soils have lost 50% of the organic matter compared with neighboring pasture land and even now our intensive grazing land is beginning to lose carbon vis-a-vis -vis our more extensive ground where we've got uh, different grassland species. The thing about it is with new cap reform, this may be coming back onto the table again because they just cannot ignore this, not alone from a European context, but from an international and global context and the point of this whole concept of getting atmospheric carbon back into the soil as a means of climate adaptation and mitigation. The greening of the cap in 2014 to 2020, it introduced a three crop rule and encouraging more rotation. I have more in, in inverted commas there because um, it's debatable whether that has really brought in the diverse rotations that Tom Fui was talking about um, for lunch. Um, you know, um, and as Tom says, every crop that you grow has to have some potential, it has to contribute something and have some marketing potential. We haven't really looked at that. Indeed, when that three crop rule was introduced, the IFA actually identified that it would be the decimation of tillage farming and crop production in Ireland. I always thought that rotations were a keystone in terms of having a viable agriculture and a sustainable agricultural system in place. In terms of ecological focus areas, cover crops qualified as an ecological focus area. And agri-environmental schemes at national level, the commission encouraged member states to actually implement uh, certain uh, measures um, along the whole area of water quality, climate change, and biodiversity. The Irish situation is very, very interesting to have a, just a small little delve into. In terms of cover crops and catch crops, they have been supported since the 1990s under the REP scheme and subsequently the AO scheme since the, uh, the late 1990s. 
Um, oats and mustard, oats that uh, Gary was talking about as well, and mustard were the main covers that were promoted in those schemes. And yet, between 1990 and, or 1998 it was, and 2010, if you look at the statistics and the data from the department, only 91 farmers grew approximately 1,000 hectares of cover crops. That was it. And during that time, uh, there were some of us, Jerry Bird, for example, who was mentioned earlier, and Robbie, actually, who mentioned him, we were going the highways and byways encouraging farmers to grow cover crops. And I'd say, Robbie, we never got higher than 1,000 hectares ourselves in terms of uptake, despite what we were actually saying at these farmer meetings. And then the glass scheme was introduced, and there was a strong push to get tillage farmers to enter glass. And the catch crop payment was increased to 155 euros per hectare. Now, remember what Gary Zimmer said. He and his colleagues are willing to spend $70 an acre on cover crops and cover crop seed for all the benefits that accrue. Sorry about this, Gary. We actually get paid to grow them, 155 euros per hectare. All right. And the thing about it is, it just shows you when you've got support of policy or when you've got a policy support, what the impact can be. Because today, uh, nearly 1,700 farmers, over 1,700 farmers, are growing 23,000 hectares of cover crops. 23,000 hectares. And in actual fact, this autumn, 40,000 hectares of cover crop seed was purchased um, under the forage uh, support scheme as well. Okay, So between glass and the forage support scheme, uh, we had an extra 17,000 hectares that were grown. That's 100,000 acres, right? From a standing start, effectively, you could call it, in 2015. Now, is that positive? Yes, it is. But there are negatives, and they're being ignored. And some of the questions came up earlier on. What cover crop do I grow in such and such a situation? And there's very little information or technical support to farmers in that regard. Plus the fact that a lot of the species that are being grown are the cheapest species available on the market, which are brassicas, and sometimes brassicas have, you know, a negative effect on the soil microbiome, but also with relation to if you're growing a brassica in your crop or your crop rotation. So we've got the policy there to support it. We haven't had the technical backup. We haven't had the support to farmers. And then the other one is loads Durban soil drills, and this was opened in March. We have a technology uh, applied modernization scheme, and it was the first effort focused um, for focus support for the crop production sector, and that opened in March 2017. And up to now, uh, Siobhan Walsh reported on this in Farm Ireland uh, uh, maybe a month, two months ago. But uh, there was a total of uh, 665 applications for low soil disturbance drills. Okay, so there's a 40% grant for the purchase of a new low soil disturbance drill, and a 60% grant if you're a qualifying young farmer under the Young Farmer Capital Investment Program. And it has been the most popular investment uh, among the crop production sector. But as well as that, uh, high-tech sprayers, that's next in line, and this is part of the Sustainable Use Directive and the increasingly stringent uh, regulations with relation to pesticide and pesticide use. So farmers are using high-tech sprayers now to be more efficient with the pesticides that they use. And the other one does, is Cambridge Rollers, which um, um, Fiona was mentioning about leather jackets this morning. But it's a part of, we actually lost the pesticide for the uh, management or the control of leather jackets. And one of the ways we're actually looking at uh, dealing with this now is through soil consolidation. So barriers to adoption of better carbon farming. Lack of funds to access technology or machinery, that's not really a barrier now in Ireland. Lack of incentive for medium and long-term investment. Land access is one aspect, and the other thing is the lack of a successor. Because if you go down this route, you're in this for the long haul. And Phil Hogan, and he's quite right about this, the Commissioner for Agriculture, as he said himself, it's just not acceptable. It's not acceptable that under 6% of the European Union farmers are under the age of 40. It's not acceptable anymore. Some farmers aren't convinced by the productivity and economic benefits, not just of uh, um, carbon farming, biological farming. 
Soil carbon sequestration is not rewarded financially, and I'm going to come to that again, and information and knowledge support is not available. And then technical solutions to uh, field issues are not really developed um, as yet. So what can we do about it? Well, if we want to address this, we have to have a number of different push factors, support factors. Education and training of young professionals. All right, and I'm going to harbour on that for a second because I'm involved in this sector. I got involved in it for the very reason, for this very reason. I mentioned at the beginning, the last time I saw James was in the college bar in UCD, and I wasn't joking because I spent a lot of my time in there. And I wasn't in lectures because when I was a student all those years ago, I did not have a Joel Williams. I did not have access to a Gary Zimmer. I did not have access to a Dan Kittredge, or even a Tom Fooey, for that example, right? I didn't even have access to Robbie Bourne, because he was in the library at the time. <laughs> but you know, it's one thing, you know, if we want to address this, we have to actually deal with the generation that are coming after us. And, you know, in terms of agriculture graduates coming out, but also young professionals, we've got the most educated young farmers in the country. There was a, a mocker and a farmer doodle here last night. But these are among the most educated young farmers, and they need to get access to this type of information as well before they start out on their farming careers. We also need to strengthen the farm advisory and knowledge transfer system because we, the backup support is quite poor. All right, if I'm a farmer, who do you call? And like farmers in Baz, they're after marching with their feet, they're supporting one another, and I fully endorse and encourage everything that they're doing uh, in the base organization. We need focused advice for farmers on improving soil carbon, and we also need focused farmer group development and support, and I don't mean something like the KT initiative, because it's too rigid, it's too administratively burdensome for everybody, from the facilitator down to the farmers themselves. And we need a bit of freedom. It's a great model, and there are positives with it, but we need to develop that. And financial support for soil carbon practices. All right? Um, and that's in TAMS now, to a certain extent. And payment for ecosystem services with public subsidies. And by the way, even though the British are talking about getting out of Europe, this is one area that farmers are focusing on now to maintain some form of transfer payment from the UK government this whole concept of ecosystem services. But then there are other pull factors. Uh, Dan would men mention some of these. Development of carbon credit schemes, including soil carbon and emissions trading systems, carbon certification schemes, compulsory standards set by food companies, improved infrastructure to access technologies, and to set mandatory targets and regula regulatory requirements for carbon sequestration. I'll just make one point about this. Um, 2009, 2009, I was speaking at a climate change conference in Dublin and I got the opportunity to talk to the uh, marketing manager for Tesco UK in Ireland at uh, that conference, okay, um, the night before the conference itself. And he was telling me that they spent a huge amount of money putting a carbon footprint, a carbon footprint on some of their uh, commodities, some of the, the, the products that they were selling on the shelves. And they've been, they'd been following it for 18 months. It made no difference whatsoever to consumer patterns or consumer behavior. All right? So these are pull factors. Don't bank on them. Don't bet on them because it might not be something that can be um, supporting farmers in the longer term. So can soil carbon improvement become a good public good? Well, the thing about it is, it already is a public good. Soil carbon impacts on, poli uh, on the public, you know, um, over 50% of what farmers do in terms of carbon management actually affects general society. So the loss of soil organic carbon is depleting soil biodiversity and microbiology. The loss of soil organic carbon has reduced water quality and increased flooding. The loss of soil organic carbon has reduced climate resilience and it has led to more greenhouse gases in the air. And the loss of soil organic carbon is putting more farmers out of business. Fact, more fertilizer, more input costs, more horsepower, right, and less profit. And you just have to look at the statistics. All right. Um, 
Will this be recognised? Will the fact that this soil carbon improvement can do so much good for the public? There's some recognition now in national schemes like Gloss and Thames in Ireland, and you've parallel schemes operating in different European member states. But more focused and targeted technical support is needed, and soil carbon needs to be included in a European emissions trading system. The current carbon price is at 25 euros per tonne. They reckon that by 2030 it will be gone up to 160 euros per tonne because the reality of what we're facing in terms of climate change adaptation and mitigation is going to take hold. For some reason, we're notoriously reluctant to uh, face up to the writing on the wall, the human species, for some reason or other. The one thing I will say to you, and Gary Zimmer mentioned it, I wrote it down. Um, and that is, don't farm the government. Don't farm the government. There's something that we have a bit of an issue in Ireland with, and I know I've been caught up in it as well, with relation to conservation agriculture. Is there a subsidy? As I say to the students uh, in Waterford, if you need a subsidy to make something viable, then it's not viable. Period. You do it because it's the right thing to do. You do it because you're going to have a more viable farm yourself and a more profitable farming operation. And that's the motivation behind it. And that's what we need to look at. And this is, again, Gary highlighted this. This is from the uh, Natural Resource Conservation Service in the USDA um, and their key principles for soil carbon management. Minimizing soil disturbance, uh, maximizing soil cover, um, minimizing or maximizing continuous living roots in the system. And we got excellent examples of farmers doing that during the course of today. They're actually doing that now uh, to a great extent. And if possible, to maximize biodiversity. And as Dan Lawler said, and Tom Fooey is doing it, you don't need to have the livestock to bring in that element of biodiversity uh, onto your farm, all right? So it's something that can, you can uh, actually uh, work your way around and implement. And the other thing is, you do need to get the nutrient balance right, okay? So don't ignore the mineral nutrition either because it's so vital and it's so, so important, all right? Thank you.